Uh, we're going to get into the Word now. And so uh, we're, we're continuing in our series through the book of 1 Samuel. Uh, we've been in this series for quite some time now. Uh, so I want you to go ahead and turn your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 17. Chapter 17. And uh, this chapter, it's a very famous chapter. It contains probably... Uh, one of the most famous, you know, if not the most famous story in all of the Bible. Uh, and that is, of course, the story of David and Goliath. Um, even for those who didn't necessarily grow up in the church, this is a very well-known story, right? My, my bet is, even if you ask uh, your non-Christian friends, they, they know of this story. They've heard about it. Um, but the thing is, as well as, as well-known as this story is, um, this is also one of the most uh, misinterpreted and misapplied stories in the Bible. Um, and the way that it is usually sort of misinterpreted, it's something along the lines of this, uh, where David, um, he sort of represents the, the underdog in the story, kind of the little guy with no power, very little power, and usually, um, you know, that's us. We kind of identify with David. And where Goliath, on the other hand, he represents sort of the giants in our lives. You know, whatever or whomever is opposing us, usually something or, or someone that's sort of like impossible or this insurmountable uh, situation or circumstance in our lives. You know, this huge giant. And uh, usually the message and the application of the story is, we can defeat our Goliaths. Like, nothing is impossible. Just as David slayed Goliath, like, we can slay our giants. That's, that's usually something along those lines is how this story is interpreted. And, and maybe you've heard that uh, applied as you've heard this message before in this story. Um, and as encouraging and as inspiring as that message is, I mean, that's a... That's a it really feel, make you feel good kind of message, you know? Uh, and even though on the surface, that basically is what happens in the David and Goliath story. You know, the little guy beats the, the big guy. That's what happens. But uh, there's much more to the story than just that, okay? There, there's a much deeper and much more significant message that is being communicated through this story, which we cannot and we should not miss if we are to rightly apply and understand this passage, okay? And so what we're going to do today is we are going to read through this entire story, all 58 verses, okay? It's 58 verses. It's a long, long story. But my guess, and this was true of me, is because you kind of are familiar with this story, uh, it's probably been a long time since you've actually read the story of David and Goliath, like the whole thing, because you're kind of like, I know this story, you know? So we're going to read the whole thing, okay? All 58 verses, and I'm going to try to help us to understand what this story is all about, what God is communicating to us through this story. Because again, it is not mainly a story about us, like David, being able to destroy the giants in our lives. And I'm not saying that that's not true or possible. I'm not saying that there's no truth to that statement. But that's not what this story is primarily about. Okay? And in case you're kind of bummed, right? some of you might be bummed right now because you're like, man, I really like that application. You know, like I really actually needed to be encouraged today. I needed to be reminded that I can slay my giants. Like I'm going through a tough time. You got to tell me that, Pastor. Let me just assure you um, what this story actually points to, I think, is even more encouraging, even more reassuring, even more comforting. When we know what this story is really about, it brings tremendous comfort. Okay, so let me just assure you that, that there will be encouragement. Uh, so with that, let me pray for us, and then we're going to dive into it, okay? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your presence. Thank you that you're with us. You're faithful. You're with your people, working all things for our good sanctifying us to become more like your son, Jesus Christ. And you've given us your word so that we could look into it, submit ourselves to it, and be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And so we pray that that would happen. And Holy Spirit of God, I pray that you would show us Jesus Christ. Open up our eyes to, to see the wonder yet again of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Open our eyes and open our hearts that we may wonder in awe in him today. We need your help. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, here we go, 1 Samuel chapter 17. So we're going to read through it, um, kind of like 
verse by verse, couple verses at a time, big chunks, and I'm just going to kind of unpack it um, here and there as we go. can't really go thoroughly with every verse because it would just take too long, but as much as we can, just going to kind of unpack as we go. So I would encourage you to have your Bibles out um, because it is a long passage. It'd be helpful for you to follow along as we go through, okay? So have your Bibles out. We're going through 1 Samuel chapter 17. All right, here we go. This is the word of God. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Soko and Azekah in Ephes Damim. Let's stop right there, okay? Uh, just to give us a, a little refresher, or maybe for those who weren't here with us in the series, just a little introduction. Um, the Philistines, okay? These guys are Israel's greatest enemy at the time, number one enemy of Israel. And they were an enemy that Israel was greatly afraid of, okay? Um, so don't think the Philistines are like this little pesky enemy that Israel can't get rid of. No, they are a huge, massive, scary, life-threatening enemy. They are a serious enemy, okay? I mean, we, if you've been with us, we learned the Philistines, they had a way bigger army than the Israelites had, right? At one point, uh, they were just, the, the troops were described as many as the sand on the seashore, right? Like, massive amount of troops. We learned that they were much more advanced in weaponry and armor. They had the best technology, all the latest, you know, gear, all that weapons, and apparently we see today that they had a giant, okay, to top it all off, they have this giant, they had the strongest, scariest warrior in all the land, okay, so this is a serious enemy that Israel has always been deeply, deeply afraid of, dreading this enemy, okay, so here's the Philistines threatening again, and the story continues, okay, that's our background. Verse 2. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Okay, or in today's standards, that would be something like nine feet, nine inches. Okay, almost 10 feet, or in the metric system, like about three meters tall. Okay, uh, now just so you know, uh, some manuscripts, there's some discrepancy here. They say it was actually four cubits in a span, not six cubits which would have made him about seven feet tall, okay, or two meters. Uh, but either way, that doesn't matter. The point is that he's huge, okay? This is a big dude, tall. Uh, verse 5 continues to describe him. He had a helmet of bronze on his head. He was armed with a coat of mail. That's scaly metal, okay? And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. That's 57 kilograms or 126 pounds, okay? That's a, very heavy. Verse 6, he had bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. Now, really quickly, you notice what word is being highlighted here, right? Four times, it's talking about bronze, 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 right? Being very descriptive to tell us he was wearing all bronze. And the reason that this is highlighted is to tell us that the Israelites were simply outmatched, okay? Again, I mentioned in the beginning, the Philistines, they had the best, the strongest weapon armor of the day, bronze, fully covered with bronze, while the Israelites, they had like farming tools, okay? You just imagine them with like little farming tools, okay? Simply outmatched. Verse 7, the shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam. His spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and his shield bearer went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves, and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants." But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. Let's stop right there. Now, what's happening here, um, what's happening here is what was called representative warfare, okay? Apparently, it was very common in the ancient world where basically one person from either army uh, would fight as a representative for his side, okay? 
uh, one person on this side, one person representing this army, and the winner would essentially win the battle for his army, okay? So Goliath, he is the representative for the enemy Philistines, and here he is challenging, uh, and really he's mocking, mocking Israel to send a representative to fight me, okay? Look at verse 10. And the Philistines said, I defy. Very, this is a key word in the text. I defy, I blaspheme, I reproach the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And you got to hear that in a mocking voice, a total mockery. He's mocking Israel. And in verse 16, okay, later on in verse 16, we read that he does this for 40 days. Okay? I want you to think about that. 40 days. That's a long time. And it says that he did this every morning and every evening. Okay? So every morning that you wake up, you wake up to the sound of, give me a man, you know, like, who's going to fight me? Every night before you go to sleep, you hear, give me a man, who's going to fight me, right? And all this is just to remind Israel how helpless you are. He's totally taunting Israel. Who's going to fight me? 40 days, there's nobody that comes up, rises up to say, I'll fight you. No one. It's a total mockery, okay? And as a result, we see in verse 11, Continuing in our text, verse 11, when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Okay. Not just afraid, greatly afraid. Okay. It's not talking about just a little, like, oh my, oh, there's Goliath again. We're kind of, like, they are devastated. Okay. Total fear and terror has come upon the land of Israel because of this giant Goliath. They are paralyzed by fear. Okay. And all of this now, sets the stage, okay, this, all this description about Goliath, how, what kind of army he, he wears, like a lot of description, right, telling us how big and bad this guy is, and then all this sets the stage now for little David to enter in, in verse 12, okay? Now, before we move on to, to read verse 12, I want to take a quick moment to explain some chronology here, okay, because it can get confusing, especially if you've been with us. It, the chronology could get a little confusing because if you remember, in the beginning of last chapter, chapter 16, beginning of that chapter, we were introduced to David as a young, insignificant little shepherd boy out in the fields. His daddy didn't even bring him to be, you know, to the anointing party. We see him getting anointed as king by the prophet Samuel, this little boy, right? That was the first half of chapter 16. And then the second half of chapter 16, by the end of chapter 16, we see that some time had passed, and it appeared that David was grown up. He'd grown up. He wasn't the same dude, insignificant little boy anymore because he's described as a man of valor. Remember that? Described as a man of war, a man of good presence, a man that Saul loved greatly, who served as his armor bearer and a personal musician. That's the last we saw of David right before chapter 17. But now, as we read verse 12 and, and David enters the scene, here he's going to be reintroduced um, as a young shepherd again with no experience in war, insignificant, small. And at the end, it appears that Saul doesn't even know who David is. He's like, who is this guy? Okay. So you might be kind of wondering, if you've been following the story, what's going on here? This doesn't kind of make sense, the chronology here. Um, and so I think the simplest way to understand this, um, the commentaries help me on this, simplest way to understand this is to understand that they did not write history like we do today. Okay. What we are used to in history is we are used to history being written chronologically, right? Well, I should do like this because you got a better perspective for you guys, right? Like this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this. That's what we are used to. Um, but that back then, um, and even you see this sometimes in the gospel writings, you see this, they often thought more in terms of major events, like significant events in a person's life. And so they kind of thought like in snapshots of people's life, like these big events in people's lives. And what they would do is essentially they would take these pictures and they would put them together in order to communicate something, okay? And so two events, even though if they were out of order, they weren't necessarily chronological, um, the author could be putting them together in order to communicate a point, okay, to get a message across. So if you think about last week, okay, the narrator, what he does is he puts these two snapshots together of David's life, 
One where he's anointed as this little insignificant shepherd boy, right? And then this other snapshot where now he's a little bit more grown up as a man, a man of war, and he's serving Saul as a mature man, it seems. Right? And he does this. The reason he does this is he's trying to show the contrast between these two, right? Remember, the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David. We see him growing in favor and stature. Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. And he's getting worse and worse and worse. And so that was why the narrator put those two snapshots together. And then here now in our passage, now the story is going backwards in chronology, back to when David was still a young shepherd boy to help communicate a different message. And what is that message? We're going to find out as we continue in the story, okay? So let's continue now. Verse 12. We're going to be reintroduced to David. Verse 12. Now, David was the son of an Ephrathite of Benjamin in Judah, named Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man, that's talking about Jesse, was already old and advanced in years. The three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to the battle, and the names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, next to him, Abinadab, and third, Shammah. David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. Now, now the reason that we are being reintroduced to David in what we, what we kind of already know about him, right? Like a lot of these details, we already know about him. The reason that these, this is being highlighted again is to simply reemphasize to us, this kid is a nobody, okay? Because we might have forgotten based on the last passage when we were like, man, this guy is amazing. And many of us, because we know David's life, we're like, David's a man of war. This guy is a conqueror. He's a great king. But the narrator wants us to be reminded this kid at this point in the story, he's a nobody, okay? He's the youngest of eight sons. He's a shepherd. He's insignificant. While his brothers, his eldest brothers, they are significant. They're fighting in the battle, right? The three oldest. Okay? And so the narrator wants to, to emphasize this on us, to remind us David is a nobody, okay? Verse 16, and we're going to read a big chunk here, so 16, and we'll go all the way to verse 27. For 40 days, the Philistine came forward and took his stand, morning and evening. And Jesse said to David, his son, take for your brothers an ephah of this parched grain and these 10 loaves, carry them quickly to the camp to your brothers. Also take these 10 cheeses to the command, commander of their thousand. See if your brothers are well and bring some token from them. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. And David rose early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper, took the provisions, and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the encampment as the host was going out to the battle line, shouting the war cry. And Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. And David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. As he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. Give me a man. And David heard him. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were very much afraid. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David said to the men who stood by him, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same way, so shall it be done to the man who kills him. All right, let's stop there. So for the first time in the story and and really in the Bible, finally we hear David speaking. This is the first recorded you know, words of David in the Bible. Of course, he's going to speak much more, right, all throughout the Psalms. We're going to see a lot more of David, but this is the first time. And here what we see is he asks two questions here. First, he asks, what's going to be done for the man who kills this Philistine? And second, who exactly is this Philistine that he can mock God and get away with it? 
Now, now the second question is what we need to pay attention to. But just for your information, the first question is there. The reason the first question is there is simply to emphasize how no one, no one dared to fight Goliath. No matter how great the rewards were, because think about it, these are some seriously good rewards, okay? Seriously good rewards. You are going to be crazy rich. The king will shower you with wealth. You get to marry his daughter, who presumably, we're going to, we're going to presume she's very beautiful, because you remember Saul, most handsome man in all of the land, right? Very, very beautiful daughter. And basically, you get a tax-free life for you and your family. No more taxes. How wonderful would that be, right? incredible i mean if you were to ask the average person like what would you do for all the money that you ever need the most beautiful spouse and a tax-free life most people would say anything right i would do anything if you were to ask the people of israel in this day they'd probably say anything except one thing except fighting goliath no way See, no matter how great the rewards were, no one dared to fight Goliath because what good is a tremendous reward if you're not alive to enjoy it, right? You'll die fighting Goliath. Every single person just assumed because of how big Goliath was, it's immediate death. Everyone assumed that except one person, David. David says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? You see, David, he assumed victory. He just assumed victory. Why? What what was the difference? Well, for one, we see he knew. He understood that compared to the living God, God Almighty, the author of of all life, who created the heavens and the earth, who made even Goliath, this God, even a 10-foot giant, is tiny compared to this God. Just a speck compared to the living God. In other words, David's focus was not on how big Goliath was. His focus was on how much bigger the living God is than Goliath. That's why he's able to respond this way, assume victory. Secondly, though, there's another reason. Secondly, we see David, he understood that Israel, Israel was the covenant people of God. God had promised the land to Israel. This land that they were standing on, that the Philistines were trying to take over, this land belonged to Israel, not to the uncircumcised Philistines. David knew this. He knew the promise to Abraham. He knew this. And so he knew and trusted that God is faithful, just like we were singing about earlier today. When God says something, he does it. He's faithful. And so he trusted in what the living God said God said this, he's going to deliver. This is our land. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he's going to defy the living God? His focus was on God. But on the other hand, verse 28, as we continue the story, here comes Eliab. Eliab, who we've already been introduced to. You remember Eliab. He's the oldest son of Jesse, David's eldest brother. And he's the guy that Samuel almost anointed as king. Remember that? Samuel saw this guy, and he's like, behold, surely the the Lord's anointed. This is him, right? But then he was rebuked. We learned an important lesson. God does not see as man sees. God looks into the heart. And here we get a glimpse of maybe perhaps why the Lord rejected Eliab, okay? We see his heart here. So verse 28, now Eliab, his eldest brother, this guy who looked like a king but did not have the heart of a king, He heard when he spoke to the men, when David spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? And by the way, it's not that Eliab really cares about the sheep. Like, who did you leave the sheep with? This is a mockery, right? He's essentially saying, go back to the sheep. You're supposed to be taking care of the sheep. Do that job. You're not supposed to be here with the men doing the important work. Who'd you leave the sheep with, right? He's mocking him. 
He goes on to say, I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? Was it not but a word? In other words, can I even speak? And he turned away from him toward another and and spoke in the same way. And the people answered him again as before. When the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul and he sent for him. So now Saul's got word of this. Verse 32, and David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he has been a man of uh, war from his youth. And as, uh, as, as you read this, you just imagine Saul, I mean, probably just laughing as he said this, <laughs> probably found this humorous. David, you're just a boy. Are you kidding me? Do you see Goliath? You're just a boy. You can't fight him. There's no way you could beat this guy. But verse 34, David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. I I, I always love this part because it's just amazing. I go, wow. Like, it wasn't even just about self-defense, right? It's like one thing if a, a lion or a bear comes and you're trying to protect the sheep. It's a whole other thing to go after and chase down this lion or this bear that has your sheep and pluck it out of its mouth. It's like, wow, right? This is what he does. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, struck him, and killed him. Your servant has struck both Uh, down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. This is really important. You, You notice where David's confidence is. It's not in himself. It's not in like his own ability or his own strength or his own power. It is in the Lord. He recognizes the Lord will deliver me. This is about God and his battle. And Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. So evidently that that story of him chasing down bears and lions, it was enough. Saul's like, okay, (laughs) you, you got some courage? Let's go. Let's see what you got, okay? And so in verse 38, okay, continuing in the story, then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor. And he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. Basically, it means he wasn't used to these things. Then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook, put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome, and in appearance mocked him. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, and listen to this, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut your head off, cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves, not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hand. What a speech, right? Like, what a sermon. This is an incredible speech. I mean, I I just get moved as even as I'm reading this. Like, wow, this full of faith, full of boldness, passion for the Lord. Like, wow, David. But here's the thing. As amazing and and truth-filled as this speech is, 
it probably still would have had little effect on those listening. Probably still would have been a joke to the people listening. Because you remember, and you really have to imagine this, that here you have this 10-foot giant Goliath covered from head to toe with bronze armor, with a spear probably the size of David himself, screaming with a deep voice, I'm going to feed your flesh to the birds of this air. And then you have David, this small, pretty little boy, no armor, no weapons, probably still at that time with a boy, little boy's voice shouting out, you come to me with sword and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the living God. Like, I probably should have read it that way because that's probably more accurate how it sounded when David was saying this. Can you imagine this? This little guy in front of this big guy, like, screaming at the top of his lung, but he's got this little boy voice saying this, right? God's going to, I'm going to feed your flesh to the bird. Like, it's a joke, Everybody is probably laughing at David. It didn't inspire a lot of courage or boldness among the Israelites watching because, like, there's this Goliath is so big. And it probably made all the Philistines just laugh, right? They're just mocking David. Are you kidding me? <laughs> nice speech, but sorry, little man. Not going to happen. He's just a kid. He's got no chance, humanly speaking, to defeat Goliath. Both sides are thinking this, okay? Both sides, Israelites and the Philistines, both thinking this is impossible. And this is exactly, exactly why David says what he does at the end of the speech. Did you notice this? At the end of verse 46, he says, the Lord is going to deliver you into my hand. Why? So that all the earth, and you just imagine he's pointing at the Philistines when he's saying this. All of the earth may know there's a God in Israel. You'll know there's a God. But not only that, verse 47 continues, and that all this assembly, and now you just imagine he's pointing at the Israelites. All of this assembly who is failing to believe in the power of God, you may know that the Lord saves not with sword or spear. So in other words, both sides here are going to learn a very important lesson. The Philistines are going to learn and see and recognize that Yahweh, the God of Israel, he's the Lord. Not Dagon, not any other false god. Yahweh is the Lord. There's no one like him. He's the God above all other gods. They're going to learn that. And Israel, they have a lesson to learn here too. God's people they are going to learn that God saves, not in the way that we normally expect. He doesn't save by human power. He doesn't save by human strength or ability or wisdom. He saves through weakness, sheer, utter weakness. He does not see as man sees. He's going to save through a little, small, insignificant, untrained in war boy, David. That is what Israel is meant to see here. That is what they are meant to learn. God saves through weakness. And that is a theme that really runs throughout the rest of the Bible. His strength is perfect in weakness. And so now, we finally get to the battle scene. I know you've been waiting for this, the battle scene. Verse 48, and let's finish up. Okay, let's get to the end of the passage. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. He ran to him. And David put his hand in his bag. He took out a stone, slung it, struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the ground. Game over. That's it. (laughs) We're all anticipating it's going to be an amazing fight. It's over already. Two verses. Verse 50. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. The Lord does not save with hand, sword, or spear. 
Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath, killed him, cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and Judah rose with a shout and pursued the Philistines as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron so that the wounded Philistines fell on the way from Sha'areim as far as Gath and Ekron. And the people of Israel came back from chasing the Philistines and they plundered their camp. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. As soon as Saul saw David go out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, as your soul lives, O king, I I do not know. And the king said, inquire whose son the boy is. And as soon as David returned from striking down the Philistine, Abner took him, brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. I mean, what a scene there. And Saul said to him, whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant, Jesse, the Bethlehemite. And that ends the reading of God's word. All right. Now, what is the point of this story? What's the point? Again, on the surface, it's really easy to see why people can take this story and think primarily that it's an inspiring story of how we, like David, can take down the giants in our life. Like as long as we believe in God and have faith in him, he'll help us to crush the giants that we face in this life. And, and again, there is truth to that point. Okay? I'm not saying that that's not true or valid. Certainly God can help us to overcome our struggles, right? But that's not the main point here, not the main point. Then I know you're asking, well, what then is the point? (laughs) Tell me already. (laughs) Well, to help us go in the right direction, okay, to correctly apply this passage, we need to ask ourselves a very important question, okay? Got to ask ourselves this question. And the question is, who are you in this story? Okay? Got to ask yourself this. Who are you? In other words, Who in this story do you identify with? Now, my guess is that that you, like me, you want to identify with David. Of course, the hero of the story. I mean, we all want to be like David, don't we? We all want to have the faith and the courage, my goodness, the boldness, the passion for the Lord that David has. We want to identify ourselves with David. But here's the thing. If you're honest, if I'm honest, the reality is we are not David. We are not David in this story. Not even close. We don't display the faith and the courage and the boldness that David does facing this huge giant, this insurmountable odds. We don't do that. Rather, we are much more like the people of Israel. Afraid when circumstances get difficult. Anxious when we're facing this financial hurdle that seems like a giant in our life. Feeling completely powerless against the Goliaths in our lives. That's who we are meant to identify with when we read this story. And what that is meant to highlight as we identify with the people of Israel, yeah, we struggle with unbelief. We know we should believe God. We know we should believe in his power. But the reality is, I don't. I'd much rather believe what I see with my eyes. What this is meant to highlight is our absolute need for a savior. Our absolute need for a rescuer. Someone to save us from the Goliath of our lives. We need a savior. And who is the savior? Well, in this story, it's David. David is the savior-like figure in this story. He slays the the, the giant, David. But of course, you look at the bigger picture. In the bigger picture of the story of the Bible, we know it is none other than Christ Jesus, the real hero. Remember last week, I, I emphasized that David, he 
points us to Jesus, right? He's, he's one of the brightest lights in all of the Old Testament, pointing us to Jesus. When we look at David's life, we should be looking for a shadow of Christ. Christ, he is the champion of the story. He's the ultimate champion, the one to whom David points to. Like David in this story, Christ, he's our representative. He's the one who fought the battle on our behalf while we stood helpless and afraid, able to do nothing in this battle. Like David, Jesus, he was opposed by all of his brothers. He was opposed by his own family members, mocked by everyone at the moment of battle. Like David, Jesus, he's the only one who trusted and believed in the promises of God fully, full of faith, full of courage. And like David, Jesus, he slayed Goliath for us in total weakness. So you see, Jesus, not us, Jesus, he's David. Jesus is the one whom David foreshadows. We see Christ in the life of David. And so understanding this now, now that we have this lens to see and interpret these kinds of stories correctly, what's the point of this story? The point of this story is to show us, us who are so afraid and helpless against the Goliath of our life, us who desperately need a savior, that just as God saved Israel by sending David in total weakness to slay Goliath, God will save us, his people, by sending Christ, God, David's greater son, in total weakness, taking on human flesh, being beaten, being mocked, being spit upon, being rejected and crucified on a cross to slay the greatest Goliath in our life. And you know who that is? Do you know what the greatest Goliath in your life really is? Do you know? I'll tell you, it is not really your overwhelming circumstances. It is not really your oppressive boss. It is not really your problems in your relationship. It is not really the sicknesses that you may be facing. Even though, don't get me wrong, all of those are real issues, real problems, real struggles. But the real giant of our lives, it is separation and punishment from God in an eternity of hell because of our sin. That is the greatest Goliath in our lives. That is the greatest problem that all humanity faces. It's the problem behind all problems, okay? Every single problem in this life, you root it back, you can trace it back, it is a result of sin. Sin has wrecked and ruined this world. And because of sin, because of this great Goliath, we were all headed hopelessly to an eternity of hell because that is what sin against the righteous and holy creator of the universe rightly deserves. Death. Eternal death. And there was nothing that we could do about this problem. Just like Israel, nothing we could do. Utterly helpless. No chance to fight against this Goliath on our own. This is an unwinnable battle. You cannot win this fight alone. But, and here's the good news, but, the good news of the gospel is that Jesus Christ our greater David, our champion. He has come to slay our Goliath. He's come. Jesus came to fight for us on our behalf as our representative. He lived the life that we should have lived. He died the death that we deserve to die as our representative. He fought the battle on our behalf, taking the full wrath of God for all of our sins in our place. He did what we could never do for ourselves. He slayed Goliath. He has crushed the enemy. He has defeated the power of sin and death, death once and for all so that we could live, brothers and sisters. 
And so church, what, what you need to understand, okay, what you need to understand is that in Christ, the real giant, the greatest giant that was confronting you and me, separation from God, it has been crushed by the life, death, resurrection of your champion, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. That's the main point of this story. Christ has come and he has defeated the Goliath of sin, slayed it once and for all. And it is because of this reality. I mean, this, everything changes because of this reality. Everything. It is because of this reality that the real Goliath in your life has been defeated. Now we can truly have courage. Now we can truly take heart when we face any of the lesser giants in our lives. Because no matter what giant you may face in your life, and remember, Jesus promised us, you're going to face giants in your life. In this life, you will have trouble. But no matter what you face, even in the midst of all of these struggles, you can take heart because you know nothing can ever separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus, my Lord. Nothing. Even if you should face a life-threatening situation, whether that be a disease, coronavirus, a freak accident maybe that threatens your life, maybe if, if the Lord should permit even persecution where we see this happening in the world, right? Even if persecution for your faith should threaten your life, you do not need to be afraid. Why? Your champion has conquered death. You do not even need to be afraid of death because your hope is beyond the grave. Nothing can snatch you out of his hands, not even death, because your champion has the power over death. You don't have to be afraid. And you can say with Paul, to live is Christ, to die is gain. My future is eternally in the hands of my champion, my Savior. He's done it. And you can have real courage, real courage. And even in the face of uncertainty. This is, this is usually a big one, right? This is usually a big one that we get afraid of. Uncertainty in life, right? Like how many of us, honestly, that, that, that gives us, uh, we lose some sleep over the uncertainty, right? What if I lose my job, you know? What, what if I don't have enough money to, to take care of my family? What, what if the housing market just keeps getting worse and worse and worse and I can't get a house? What am I going to do? What if I can't get my kids through to, to the education that I want them to get? What if I never get married? And on and on and on. I mean, we have these fears about the future, right? But because of what, of, but because of what Christ has done, we can take courage in facing these fears because we know that we have something way more secure than anything this world could ever offer. Christ Jesus is yours. The one who rules the universe the one who holds the universe in the palm of his hand, the one who is with you always to the end of the age, and the one, get this, remember, the one who has promised you that he goes to prepare a place for you in his father's house. You ever think about that? In his father's house. What's that like? Well, I'm not exactly sure, but you better believe that it is way better and way more secure and way more satisfying than any house this world can offer you. Way more. Nothing can take that away from you because your champion has won. We can have courage. Whatever comes our way, we can have courage because we look to the faithfulness of Christ. See, he's overcome and he's with us and he's working everything for our good. We can trust him. And this is, to me, this is such a more encouraging message, knowing that we can get through these hurdles because the reality is, if we just think, yeah, God is going to help me get through every hurdle, I'm going to overcome all of my giants, what happens when you don't? God keeps you in the desert, right? And you get discouraged. Is God with me? Do I have enough faith in God? It's not the point. He's overcome. He's with you. He will never leave you, and he will help you. He will sustain you. He will walk with you. He will sanctify. He will grow you. And he will take you to where you need to be. No matter what, you can have courage knowing he's won. That champion who slayed that Goliath, he's on your side. You are his. You are his brother. You are a child of the living God. He's yours. Take courage. Our champion has won. Amen? 
Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Hallelujah. Father, what, what can we say but hallelujah? What can we say when we are reminded in this story of what you have done in Christ for us, how you have sent your son in total weakness to be our representative, to take upon his shoulders the sins that we have committed, the sins that we deserve to be crucified on the cross for. You've sent, you put place those sins on Jesus, and he's died in our place. And not only did he die, but he resurrected from the grave. He's overcome the grave so that in him we too can live. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for, your, for the great message of your gospel, yet again reminding us that our champion has won, that there's nothing we have to fear. You're with us, and you're for us. And I pray, by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would help your children to believe this. Help us to see how much bigger you are. Help us to see how much greater you are. Lord, we confess we are so prone to walk by sight, prone to see how big the Goliaths or the, the issues, the problems, the financial hardships, the, the, the work situation, all of these things in our life, we tend to over see how, focus on just how big those things seem, but Lord, help us by faith to elevate our gaze to the champion who says to us, I'm with you, I will never leave you. And I'm working everything for your good. You are more than a conqueror in me. Because everything that the enemy means to harm you and bring you down, I'm using it for your good. Take heart, brother. Take heart, child. Help us to believe this, God. Help us. Holy Spirit, strengthen our hearts. There are many, I know, who are listening to this that are struggling in our hearts to believe. Holy Spirit, only you can do this. Strengthen our hearts to believe Christ is with us. Help us to believe who he is and marvel in what he has done for us. And may that, may the fruit that comes out of, of us seeing and rejoicing in Christ, may it be worship to you. May it be living our lives for the glory of your name, declaring to the world, there is a God who rules and reigns, and his name is Jesus Christ. He is the Savior. He's the only hope. Help us to be your light, to shine your light in such a dark and desperate world who's living in fear and turmoil and tormented by the weight of sin. Help us to shine the light of your gospel and your grace, to declare to the world there is a savior, there is a champion. Help us, Lord, for the glory of your name. We thank you so much for your word. We love you because you have first loved us. We thank you for this love you've given us in our hearts because you've loved us. You've set your steadfast love upon us. You've died for us. We thank you. We worship you. We honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you, brothers and sisters.